thank you everyone uh, very much for your time today. We appreciate having you here. And James, I will pass it over to you. Thanks very much. And, and thank you to everybody for being here today. As, as Colleen mentioned, my name is James Warren. I'm the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer with the Comox Valley Regional District. We're looking forward to being able to provide additional information about this proposed service. We know it's of significant interest to the community. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are working on the traditional and unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. We are so thankful to have the opportunity to live and work in this beautiful community. The Comox Valley is changing quickly. Services, both public and private, are changing too. It's a mix of these changes that has brought us here to talk roadside garbage, recycling, and yard waste collection in our electoral areas. It's a priority for all of us to ensure that our waste is managed properly. That means making sure it goes to the right place and is managed in an environmentally responsible manner. A roadside collection program will do that, along with preserving landfill space with improved convenience, and in some cases, reduced costs for some of those who are currently using a private hauler. We appreciated very much the over 3,000 people who gave their time last fall to fill out our survey, and that feedback has given us the guidance to develop a proposed service and present it here for you today. Ultimately, it will be up to you whether this service goes ahead as an alternative approval process will be held in June and early July to seek elector approval. So please take this time to ask any questions you have and learn about what is being proposed. We have all the experts on hand ready to help. I think I, I then look to Vivian to, uh, to help us through the next set of slides. Awesome, thank you so much, James. Can everybody hear me? Um, thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, so we're gonna dive right into the first slide. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pauline. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, roadside collection is a desirable service uh, for both residents and for local government. I see a question that's already come up as to why um, we're tackling this. So for the CVRD, as we're managing our landfill and consider our strategic priorities uh, around environmental stewardship, we see this opportunity for roadside collection service to really help increase rates of recycling, uh, ease pressure on the landfill by ensuring only uh, garbage ends up at the landfill and improving air quality by reducing uh, backyard burning. For residents, uh, the roadside collection program uh, can improve convenience um, by bringing that pickup to you, uh, reducing costs um, when compared to individual subscription services and reducing the heavy vehicle, uh, vehicle traffic on residential streets. So working together, a roadside collection service can reduce our overall uh, environmental footprint. Um, and to the question that uh, has been posed um, in the chat box, uh, in 2013, um, it is a, a referendum on the service was not successful. Um, and some of you may be wondering why we're talking about this again today. Um, so there's a number of reasons. Um, number one, the consolidation of waste uh, service providers in the area has impacted options available to the community and it's uh, increased costs for private subscriptions. Um, uh, sorry private subscription garbage collection service. And number two, uh, unmanned recycling depots have been closed due to challenges with uh, compliance and contamination. Uh, however, this reduces, can, we recognize that this uh, reduces contamination for some. And then lastly, uh, we as staff uh, and your electoral area directors have been receiving ongoing continued requests uh, by members of the public for a service like this. So given all of this, uh, we felt that this is the right time, uh, eight, year later, eight years later, to ask the community again. So um, moving on to the next slide. So last summer, uh, we launched a survey asking residents whether they were interested in roadside collection garbage, roadside garbage and recycling collection based on an estimate uh, of about $150 to $250 a year. Uh, we invited residents uh, to participate by inviting or sending out direct letters to every property and promoted the survey using advertising, including print, social media, and press releases. Um, we had 3,073 residents fill out the survey over in over 13 neighborhoods. So that's 521 in area A, uh, 1,248 in area B, and 1,304 in area C. And overall, 74% uh, of residents, uh, respondents were interested in the creation of this new service, ranging anywhere between 63% um, to 83% by neighborhood. 
Uh, if you're interested, we published the full breakdown of all of these results um, by neighborhood on the project's website at uh, www.comoxvalleyrd backslash roadside collection. Um, the summary report is also available on there as well. So based on these results um, and the additional technical review that was conducted, uh, electoral areas to, the electoral area directors divided, decided to move 11 of the 13 neighborhoods forward. Uh, the two that were removed were Minto Road and Forbidden Plateau Road areas due to the lower degree of interest as well as the housing density and road conditions, which would make it difficult for um, a contractor to service this area in an affordable way. So with that direction, um, our team has been assessing what a service would look like considering what residents told us in the survey and what they wanted to see and what can be provided within the cost estimate that was originally provided. So I'll uh, pass this over to Sarah Willey now to uh, provide more information about the service and the proposed uh, delivery. Thanks very much, Vivian. And I do definitely wanna thank everyone who did participate in our survey in the fall. Uh, I took the time to read everybody's comments um, both for and against, and, and certainly those insights were brought into our decision as we moved forward. So along with asking residents about their interest in a roadside service, we also uh, asked them specifics about what that service might look like uh, if it were to move ahead. And so based on that feedback, uh, we developed a proposal for the service levels, um, and that's biweekly uh, garbage. So that's every other week garbage with a two can limit and the addition, the ability for folks to add additional cans up to two cans by purchasing bag tags and adding to their, to their allowable volume. And that's a per dwelling uh, volume. So if you do have two dwellings, uh, you have uh, four cans as your limit um, and, and be charged uh, for each dwelling. The recycling is also every other week, bi-weekly, and that's an unlimited volume. So you can use uh, the containers that you're already using to maybe take your recycling to a, a depot um, or you can uh, purchase a lidded container and, and keep everything nice and dry and, and tidy. Um, we also asked questions about yard waste uh, and you know with that we tried to land on, a, on a, a middle ground for yard waste and provide for those who may not have the ability to bring yard waste uh, to a facility um, and we, we want to make sure that it's not going into the garbage uh, and to reduce um, burning during the dry season as well. So for yard waste, we've got uh, six bags per month limit. So it would be once per month picking up yard waste. And those could be those craft paper bags we're used to. They could also be, you know, a garbage can that you've labeled yard waste or something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just wanted to provide that service to people as well. So that's listed for March to September during that peak growing season. The cost estimate for that service, and again, that's just yard waste is from March to September. The other recycling and garbage would be all year round. And the estimated cost for that service is 200 to $250 per year or 50 to $64 per quarter. And those cost estimates are coming from uh, comparative uh, analysis of neighboring communities with very similar services, as well as our own service here in Royston. That service would be provided by privately owned waste hauling companies contracted by the CBRD, not by CBRD staff themselves. We're going to undertake a competitive bid process if the AAP moves forward, and that would be held to determine the successful contractor or contractors we are looking at having more than one contractor to service this community uh, should things move forward. All contractors are gonna be welcome to participate in the bid process. And once we've completed that, we'll have a, a more uh, refined cost, but it will be within that 200 to $250 estimate that we've provided. The electoral area directors have asked us specifically to make sure that good customer service is a priority in the bid process. We've heard a lot of uh, reports of great customer service coming from some small and uh, local companies, as well as some of our, our large companies that are operating in the region currently. And we know that that's important to people. We also wanna make sure that the process is accessible to service providers of all sizes, large and small. So we will be making accommodations within the, pro the procurement process 
to make sure that it is possible for not just large multinational companies to participate in that process. And as staff, we're committed to making sure that those priorities are met. So for many of you, uh, you may have been trying to determine whether or not your property is included in the proposed service or not. Um, and I hope that you've had an opportunity to go to our website and check out uh, the map, the interactive map that we've created. So here on the screen, just before we move to the interactive map, we're showing the three different areas, Southern, Central and Northern in blue, orange and purple. And those are the three different AAPs that are available uh, for people to participate in. And then we'll just move over to the interactive map if we can, Colleen, thank you. I'm just gonna switch screens, so just bear with me for a moment. She's got it all queued up. You can tell Sorry, she, guys. <laughs> she, did, she did the little demo before, you know. Okay, that looks great. Thank you. Yeah. So when you open it up, uh, there's some fine print there. It asks you to agree. You click off that. Then it shows you the legend on the left-hand side. So again, I'll just call out the Northern, Central, and Southern Collection Services. Those don't quite align with area A, B, and C. And we did that to recognize the, the results of the survey. So the, the, the behavioral patterns that people indicated through the survey showed that people in the orange area tended to use the services within the urban areas and people in the purple area tended to utilize more heavily the uh, CSWM depot that's located in Black Creek Oyster River. So if you just wanna close up that legend there, Colleen, the next thing that you can do is head up to the top there and it says enter your address here. So we just want to type in that address that we had calling, I think it was 299 wireless and just go a little bit slow as you're typing your address in and you'll see that that pre-populates below. So that's great. And then you can just select and it'll zoom right in for you. You also have the ability to just zoom into your property as well if you're comfortable doing that. Um, but certainly this is, is a pretty quick and easy way to do it. So in this particular property, uh, if you then click on your property and any property really, a little text box comes up and it shows you a number of uh, features or property uh, criteria that, uh, that, are, that were present, I guess, or for each of those, each of those uh, properties. So in the, the green area, that's kind of what I want to highlight there. So it says this property is excluded in the proposed central collection service. So that's really what, uh, what you want to look for if you're trying to determine if your property is in or out. And then if it is in or out, you want to remember which service area it's in. Um, so central is this particular one in orange. And you can see the property adjacent there is highlighted orange and says this property is included in the proposed service area. You can see that one there, the actual use category is residential, whereas the adjacent property that we just looked at, the use category for this is civic, institutional, and recreational. It's actually um, uh, like a radar station or a fishery station or something like that. It's part of a federal government building. So that was the kind of information that we used to determine whether properties were in or out. So we were looking specifically to service residential properties. Um, and excluding things like federal government buildings, uh, churches, uh, industrial uses, uh, commercial properties, and that sort of thing. Great. Thanks very much, Colleen. And if anyone has any troubles navigating through that map, you know, or you're unclear about which service area that you're in, please do feel free to contact the office and we can help you look through the map um, and look up your property for you. There's also uh, a little bit more that we want to discuss about exemptions and exclusions. Uh, as I mentioned, there's sort of those commercial properties, but a big one as well was vacant land. So where there is no dwelling, uh, there is no need for a garbage service. So vacant land is excluded from the proposed service. 
as well as multifamily residential dwellings served by a central collection point. So what does that mean? That's, that's like an apartment building that might have a centralized bin, you know, the kind that you would come in with the forks, pick it up and toss it over the back of the truck. That's not the kind of service that uh, we're looking to support as they are different trucks than what come and pick up garbage cans from the end of your street. Um, and so those multifamily residential dwellings uh, we're looking to exclude. If there's some of those that are better served by individual cans and driveways, then that's something that we can look to uh, have conversations with and do please reach out as a strata. Other exclusions, as I mentioned, are industrial, commercial, institutional buildings, schools included in that, and also mobile home parks served by, again, a central collection point. So that's, that's another one of those where if, uh, if your mobile home park uh, is currently served by a waste hauler and you think that that's, this service is something that could work for your area, then please give us a call and we can chat. Recreational vehicles, which are different than manufactured homes, those are excluded. There are some temporary uses of recreational vehicles during constructions of homes, uh, but again, those are kind of those niche situations out there. And then farms. So farms are a different one in that we wanted to recognize that farm uses vary significantly from property to property and that they're often people's homes as well as a farm. Um, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they can be large. Sometimes they can be small. So owners would, can uh, provide a, a farm classification with BC assessment. And if you have an active account with the Comox Valley Waste Management Center showing that you bring your garbage there or if you have a subscription to a waste hauler and that's how you like to manage your waste, uh, then we can uh, look at excluding your property from the service area. But we do wanna give that transparency and that reassurance that your waste will continue to be managed in a responsible way and that the waste will end up in our engineered landfill. So with that overview of the proposed service, I'll pass it back to Vivian to outline the next steps for the community. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so further to what James has said, the next steps uh, for this project here lies with you, the residents. Uh, the alternative approval process, or the AAP, as we we're referring it to, um, it will be held from June 3rd to July 5th this year for the service. Uh, an AAP, known to some as the counter petition, uh, is an alternative to a referendum and was selected for this project because of the degree of support indicated in the 2022, or sorry, 2020 consultation. So if you support the service, no further action is required. If you oppose the creation of the service, uh, you will need to submit a form. So the AAP includes um, three proposed service area, which we showed, uh, Sarah had showed earlier and on the map. So there's the Southern Collection Service Area, Central Collection Service Area and the Northern Collection Service Area. It is really important to note that the service boundaries do not correlate to the electoral service boundaries. While the Northern Collection Service Area is made up of solely properties within the electoral area C and the Southern Collection Boundary only includes residents from electoral area A, uh, the central collection service boundary incorporates properties from all three electoral areas, A, B, and C. So if you're submitting a form to oppose the service, please make sure that you're checking the map that Sarah had just ran through to ensure that you are choosing the right boundaries for your address. And we're happy to help, um, help you determine what service boundaries you fall within for this AAP, either through email, over the phone, or by visiting us uh, in person here at the office. Uh, we have more information about the AAP generally and, and the links to the info you need for this service is located at um, www.comoxvalleyrd.ca backslash AAP. And the AAP will be advertised in the Comox Valley record uh, throughout May and June. And with that, uh, I'd like to pass it back over to, uh, for any questions that you may have. Thank you guys. Uh, there's lots of good information in that. And I'm just going to switch to the next slide because it has a few of the website addresses and the contact information that you've uh, mentioned through the presentation just as a good reference for people um, as they're starting to collect 
uh, starting to think about any kind of further questions. So we've had a number of questions come in during the presentation, which is great. And I'm going to kind of dive right in. I know, Vivian, you hit off the first one uh, in your presentation. So um, just kind of moving down the list. Uh, there was a question just about maybe a bit more about the AAP. What happens if there is a 10% uh, return um, of forms indicating kind of 10% of opposition? And then is there kind of a threshold that then occurs around a referendum? Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, yes, that's, uh, that is correct. Uh, the specific cutoff, um, Jake Martins will be able to uh, speak further to that. Thanks, Vivian. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, so yeah, as the, the individual noted, there is a 10% threshold with the AAP. And so if that is surpassed, then uh, those results will be brought forward to the board. And uh, the board then has a few options. They can then uh, choose to abandon the initiative if they want, or they can then proceed through an assent vote or what's known as a uh, commonly known as a ref referendum. Uh, or they can uh, consider any all alternative approaches that they might want to take. But generally, uh, at that point, it's either proceed to a uh, referendum or uh, or abandon the initiative. But uh, each initiative may have a, an, an alternative option uh, depending on uh, what's available. If it does proceed to a referendum, the threshold is 50% plus one of those votes cast. So um, there's not a 75 or a super majority, just 50% plus one of the votes that are cast during that referendum. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have a resident who's asking whether or not excluded properties will still be required to pay for the service. So if they're in one of those electoral areas, but excluded, um, you know, maybe a property on Minto Road, for example, is there is there still going to be a cost to them? No, there, this service is uh, entirely user funded. So it's only people that are subscribed to the service uh, that are sorry that will that are eligible for the service will be paying to the service. So if you are either exempted, um, excluded, or outside of the proposed service area, you will not be paying for the service. Great. And so then also a question about whether or not there's opportunity for a group of people like in a neighborhood or along a street to come if they are, you know, all opposed to the idea of this new service can, can there be an opportunity for an exemption of, you know, a specific street if all the owners on that property are, are opposed to it? Um, if it's an eligible property, uh, it will be deemed as part of the eligible service area and it will be part of the service. So you would be required to be in, paying into it. Um, that's not to say that you have to use it if you choose not to. Um, furthermore, if there is any logistical reasons as to why we can't access it, and that would be have to be worked out with, a, with the successful contractor, we can look at it on a case by case basis. But um, again, like we, the intended goal of the service is to really just make diversion as easy as possible for as many residents as we can. Um, so that as a community that we can um, ensure that proper management of waste that uh, James had talked about. And that's just making sure that we are able to um, again, manage our voice in an environmentally responsible manner. So that's, we understand that this isn't a really a, um, it's a really difficult to find that one size fit all solution for everybody, but uh, this is a regional service that we're gonna be putting out there for the entire community if this does pass, um, the, or sorry, if the AAP does pass. Okay. There are a few comments uh, in the chat that aren't questions. There, there's some feedback and opinions, which is, it's totally um, welcome there in the chat. Um, so we, we will be just just so that those people don't feel like we're kind of scanning over them. We will be kind of pulling together all the chat comments. They'll form a part of um, our follow up here uh, with the team. So so still feel free to drop those in there. I just want to make sure that we get to the questions uh, where some additional information is needed from the project team uh, during this time that we have with you. Um, so Vivian, there was a question just about how, you know, we've used this reference for the current garbage collection costs and what that estimate is. Um, and so there's a question about kind of where that estimate came from, because some property owners have, you know, they pay different amounts than that, but get a different level of service. Um, and so they don't, they don't want to be kind of comparing to totally different um, scenarios. So maybe we could give a bit more information about how that uh, cost estimate was provided. 
For sure. Thank you so much again for that question. Um, so we this all of this information was based off of the consultation results that we had received back in fall of last year. Uh, we had over 3,000 respondents and um, almost 2,000 respondents uh, indicated that they were currently subscribed to uh, some form of garbage uh, pickup service and uh, participants were asked if they wanted weekly or bi-weekly garbage collection and if they wanted one can, two cans uh, or more to be included in that service. So um, preference for those that were, um, that had subscription services for their garbage, uh, it was evenly split uh, between all the different combinations. So, um, and then there were those that uh, take their material to the landfill self haul. Um, that was typically the lower cost method and they prefer the bi-weekly pickup option. Um, so incorporating all of that survey response um, for best practices for service delivery models. Um, so we that's how we came to the recommendation for doing the bi-weekly service with the two cans for each uh, each pickup with the, opt uh, with the option for the additional two cans. And we, again, recognizing that we're servicing a wide range of demographics. Um, everybody has different waste um, uh, or waste disposal needs. So uh, there is that option for people that do have um, higher require higher capacity. So um, so that cost is based off of what we think uh, people are actually wanting based off of these survey results. Um, that kind of provides a gist of how we came to that recommendation. Um, I'll defer this over over to Sarah as well because she has much more intimate knowledge as to how um, we came about the final service. Yeah, I, I think you covered it well, Vivian. I I think just again acknowledging that we recognize it, it is difficult to to get exactly what everybody wants. Um, we're certainly hearing from folks that are, are really great at diverting their waste already and, and create very little waste. And you know they feel challenged to, um, to be paying for a service that exceeds their needs. And we're also he hearing from people that would really prefer weekly over biweekly because that's what they're used to or that's what they feel would meet their needs. So we really did try to strike a balance um, and, you know, we, we acknowledge that it isn't going to be perfect um, if it is, you know, a service that we move forward with. Um, but, you know, do recognize that everybody's comments were read and heard and, and you know, brought into the conversation and, and then that's how we moved forward. Great. I'm seeing a few questions just about cost, um, specifically because of the kind of 150 to 250 estimate that was a part of the original survey and then the current estimate. So I'm just hoping we can uh, just be really clear about kind of that original number and what the current number is and kind of maybe why that transition has happened. I think we'll cover a few questions if we give a bit of an overview of that. Yes, for sure. That's a great question. So the original um, cost estimate that was provided uh, during the fall uh, was between $150 to $250. And that was based on a jurisdictional scan of um, similar service within uh, British Columbia. Um, so as we were able to, once we got those survey results in, and based off of the proposed um, service level uh, that Sarah had talked about, uh, the garbage bi-weekly, um, recycling bi-weekly, and the, sorry, so and for all year round for those two waste streams, and then the uh, seasonal pickup of yard waste, we were able to better refine that cost estimate um, down to 200 to $250. Um, we are working off of the most, um, sorry, the most up-to-date information that is available to us. But as uh, Sarah had mentioned, um, we're gonna be going through a competitive uh, procurement process to select the uh, preferred um, waste service uh, contractors, contractor or contractors. And at that time, we'll be able to better solidify that number, that costing. Great. Um, I had a question just come to me directly um, about whether or not um, there is the potential for related uh, yard waste burning um, restrictions um, that could kind of come in, uh, come into play alongside this. Like is, is introducing yard waste collection um, a first step to uh, banning um, backyard burning? No, um, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, 
no, that there's no hidden motive here. This is strictly just to provide um, more improved and convenience for residents so that they can dispose of their waste. Um, there is a segment of the resin that do burn their waste. While you, uh, as you mentioned, it's mostly yard waste, but there are some that burn garbage and recycling as well, which has negative, um, obvious negative consequences, including leachate, um, uh, sorry, leaching of um, contaminants into the ground and the surface water, along with the creation of um, dioxins and furans. So uh, with that improved convenience of the collection system by bringing that collection to you, uh, which includes recycling, we can anticipate overall air, improved air quality, as well as improved uh, diversion rates. Um, so it's, but specific to yard waste, there's, it's not our intention to do so. Yeah, and I'd maybe just add to that, Vivian, that when we spoke with some of the current subscription haulers, they mentioned that people are challenged to manage their yard waste um, and that consequently people put it in the garbage now. And we do want to uh, offer opportunities for that organic material to go to the right stream to reduce methane emissions from our landfill. Um, and again, so it sort of complements that convenience factor of, of people will sometimes just do what's, what's easiest <clears throat> if not given another option. So. Okay. Great. And so maybe kind of a related motivating factor question that there's another question that's come in just asking about whether or not um, the proposed service is, is actually an effort to reduce the number of people who are visiting the landfill. We are seeing a uh, drastic increase uh, in, at, uh, uh, at, our, at our landfill, but uh, that's not the underlying motive. Um, again, it's to provide that to overall um, improved convenience to residents. Um, we are seeing a, an increase in the visitors uh, at our, both of our landfills and here in, in Cumberland and Campbell River, but uh, that could be indicative of just increasing population in the valley. But uh, that's, not the, that's not the underlying motive. Um, I have a question in the chat and it actually reflects a couple that we had come in by email as well, Vivian, which is about the process for choosing a vendor and what that will look like. Um, and specifically whether or not, so just confirming that we don't yet know who the vendor would be. Um, and then in that selection process, is there an opportunity to be able to give preference to locally owned businesses in order to support um, obviously a local, a local business opportunity? Uh, thank you for that question. That is, uh, we've heard that um, throughout the survey um, and also uh, in the recent uh, couple of weeks uh, since we've started this uh, phase two engagement. Um, it is a strong sentiment amongst um, the res uh, sorry, the, the respondents and the people that have uh, reached out that uh, there is a lot of value in um, good customer service uh, and that's not surprising. So recognizing that um, when we go through the competitive, com competitive procurement process um, that will be weighed fairly heavily uh, to ensure that, again, like we just wanna make sure that we're providing great service uh, to our residents if this AEP is successful and um, customer service will be ranked, um, will be, it, it will be uh, a huge component of the weighting um, for, the, for the scoring. Where is the yard waste uh, going to be headed? What facility does it go to? Uh, that is still up for discussion, but um, right now the yard waste, uh, they will likely go to the bio facility um, just uh, to the, at the next uh, block down. Um, but that... The biosolids composting yes. operation. Yes, yeah. Sorry. Thank so you. the Comox Valley Waste Management Center yard waste uh, is taken and mixed in with the biosolids from the Water Pollution Control Center to create that skyrocket project. Pro, pro, what am I looking for? <laughs> the skyrocket product, that's the word. Um, so that would likely be the, the direction that that yard waste would head, not be hauled up to Campbell River to be combined with the food waste. Okay. Another question about cost. So just so that we're really clear, the current estimate is in the two hundred to two hundred and fifty dollar range, which is just narrowed down from the original kind of wider estimate of one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty. Is that right, Vivian? Yes, that's correct. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so for the AAP, if you are not within the eligible service area as outlined in the on the map, 
then there's no need to participate in the AAP. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm just going to jump to a couple email questions so that we can uh, make sure that those are covered off. Thank you for those who submitted them in advance. Um, I mean, the first one, we, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but is it is it going to be possible for just an individual property to opt out of this service? If this um, AP does pass and you are an eligible, considered an eligible single family dwelling that is within the service area, um, you will not be able to opt out. You don't necessarily need to participate if you don't want to, but uh, the, you will be paying for that service. Okay. And then a couple questions kind of specifically about the service, and these may not be answerable at this point, um, but you know, is there information at this point time about what will happen, for example, if a pickup date is missed uh, because of uh, bad weather or uh, garbage truck uh, troubles? Um, do we have that kind of information at this point? Uh, we don't have that level of detail, but uh, just based off the experience, like that will be easily worked into the contract um, to be sure that there is a seamless um, service. Uh, there is the expectation that they will be serviced. Um, even if they are missed. So in my past experience, if there is a snow day perhaps, or if there's a truck breakdown, um, there could potentially be a requirement within the contract to require them to have a contingency plan, whether that is a, um, an extra truck within the fleet to be able to service that or doing it on a makeup day. So there are different options, but uh, the, the expectation is that they, the residents will be serviced. Um, Obviously with garbage, there will be less leniency but with recycling uh, because of obviously, um, generally speaking, there shouldn't be, a, they shouldn't attract um, vectors and things of that nature. Uh, there may be some leeway there, but uh, we will be able to work that within the operations contract to be able to hammer out those uh, details. Okay. And then what about around things like the recycling service? Do we know the details about what, for example, a roadside recycling service would be able to collect? Can it include glass? Can it include oh, yes. Sorry, plastic film No, um, that's a new one, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so um, we are working towards a uh, potential partnership with Recycle BC um, as a roadside uh, collector of the printed paper and packaging material for single family homes. Um, so if we're successful, all of the materials that are collected will flow through the Recycle BC uh, network, which will take care of the processing and the marketing of the material, um, as well as uh, a compensation for materials, which will represent a huge cost savings uh, to the overall program, uh, which will be passed along to the residents. So um, as such, this proposed service uh, will need to align with the Recycle BC list of acceptable items and their, um, it, and it's uh, provided on our web, I, I'm not sure if it's provided on our website, but uh, we will be, putting it on there if it's not there already. So, but regardless of whether of, uh, CVRD is part of this Recycle BC program or not, uh, glass, soft plastics and styrofoam would not be included as part of the roadside um, pickup because they require special handling and processing. So specifically to, gel, to glass, uh, tipping glass into a recycling truck, um, as you can appreciate, it will break uh, and contaminate other recyclables um, with the bits of broken glass. And separating that glass material from other recyclables uh, will increase, um, well, it's, 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 it's viewed as contamination and it will actually um, reduce the amount of recyclability of the other material. So, and also from a safety standpoint, um, broken glass poses a safety hazard uh, for workers on the receiving end of the, the processing plant. So there is, as there's a initial manual sort, uh, as soon as you come in. Um, so if it's collected at roadside, the glass would need to be separated, as, sorry, collected in a separate bin. Um, and generally speaking, glass makes up a fairly small portion of the overall waste stream. Um, and if it were to be included in this program, uh, the separation of glass and the, um, sorry, the separation of glass and materials, um, relative to the amount of glass and the corresponding diversion uh, would be very costly. So um, it would not be included. Um, for soft plastics, um, so these are things like plastic bags. 
uh, it would also not be included as part of the roadside collection as it causes operational uh, issues at the processing facilities. Uh, the materials get wound up kind of like rope um, in, the, in the screens and has a potential to shut down an entire plant. Um, so, and it requires uh, separate handling um, altogether. And then for styrofoam, sorry, I know this is a really lengthy response. Um, uh, so for styrofoam, it's, as you can appreciate, uh, foam breaks down and it needs to be handled separately and it crumbles really easily during that uh, collection process. So the broken pieces, again, similar to glass, it's really difficult to separate from the other recyclables and it causes uh, contamination. So um, it needs to be processed separately. Okay. And maybe just add to that, Vivian, that you know that list of recyclables that you've mentioned, that's consistent with what we currently accept <clears throat> at the CSWM depot at Canex as well as uh, Oyster River Black Creek, um, and also what uh, is available to other curbside programs within the Valley. So we feel that it creates a strong educational message to have a consistent list of, of materials or sort of basket of goods going into those bins. Great. Um, so we have a question just about why, why is it that this kind of service isn't something that just some people can choose to sign on to and others can just choose not to. Um, kind of why does it have to be a full area uh, implementation? Uh, why can't the people who just want it pay for it and receive it and not the others? That's a great question. Um, in order for a uh, for the system to work, um, and again, to be able to uh, benefit from that scale of economy as well, to be able to provide that's the service across the region at the price that we've indicated, um, it, it makes the most sense uh, to be able to do it as a regional service. Um, again, it's to, it, from an administrative standpoint, um, it would be really difficult to um, administer a program for, uh, especially a, a manual collection system uh, for people that are opting in and opting out. So it's uh, it's it's a decision that uh, the board has made to provide this as a regional service overall. Um, so a couple of questions about the actual, the bins. So one is, is do we expect that there will be a standard can or bag size criteria for the roadside collection service? And secondly, do you have an estimate about what extra bag tags might cost? Yeah, so the, uh, the standard can slash bag size, uh, it'll be limited to 50 pounds uh, gross weight or uh, jet, like, probably 100 liter capacity. Um, this is based off of um, work safe uh, bylaws, or sorry, their work safe regulations to ensure the safety of the workers. So this is a manual collection service. And as you can appreciate, um, it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a very labor intensive task. So it's, uh, we do want to make sure that we're limiting that to, um, to help save the backs of um, the people that will be picking up this material. Um, sorry, what was the second question again? We have a cost estimate for extra bag tags at this point. Uh, that has not been worked out um, as far as I'm aware, but uh, it will be relative to the cost of disposal. Uh, Sarah might be able to um, elaborate on that. Yeah, the current cost for the Royston service is $2 a tag, um, but that hasn't changed since the service was established. So, you know, that gives you a bit of a, a, a price point to, to start from, but uh, not a commitment that it'll be $2 a bag. But uh, as Vivian says, I think we'll look at, you know, what that tipping fee cost would be and, and then also um, what the hauler cost in their contract is for, for managing that for us. So yeah, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. So, and then what is the process if a property has a renter or a tenant in it? Is it the property owner who puts in a, who, like if they want to oppose a project, is it a, the property owner or the tenant who participates in the AAP? Um, can a tenant have a say, I guess, on, um, on this service? I think the answer is yes, um, but uh, Jake will be able to provide a, a more clear answer. Yeah, thanks, Vivian. And, and you're correct. The answer is yes. I'll just uh, expand just a little bit. So uh, there are essentially two categories of electors that can participate. There's a resident elector, so they can be someone that lives in the service area they either own that property or they may rent that property 
Um, either way, if they live in there, they're a resident elector, and as long as they meet the other qualifications, which are generally that they're over the age of 18 and Canadian citizen and so on, uh, they are there or eligible. And then the other category is a non-resident property elector. And that, so that's somebody that may own property in the service area, but not live in that service area. And so there are eligibility requirements uh, for those individuals in which they may be able to respond by submitting a form. And again, those details are outlined on our website, and I'd encourage everyone just to take a look at those. Great. I have a question, um, just some concern about people's ability to be able to participate in, in online sessions and some of the challenges obviously posed with public engagement uh, in COVID times. And so um, the question is, why, why is this process moving forward now? Obviously, given kind of the challenges um, with COVID, uh, uh, making it more difficult, obviously, for people to be able to come together for learning opportunities. Um, and so maybe kind of by extension to that, if uh, there are people who, what are kind of maybe low tech ways that people can get some additional information um, about this uh, moving forward? Yes, as, uh, as you can appreciate, this is, these are challenging times um, and it's, it's difficult to uh, get people together. Um, so this it, right now, this format is the, the best possible way. Um, it's to be able to engage with residents. Um, but as yes, I, I agree, it's it's not a, a true open house as we're all accustomed to. But this has also opened the doors for um, conversely, though, it does open up the doors for uh, more people to participate that wouldn't be able to physically attend in person as well. Um, it's uh, it, it is a, a decision that uh, the the directors wanted to push ahead. So that's uh, and based off of the uh, the information that we provided, um, there there's been a lot of interest in this uh, service, the creation of this service. So um, now was deemed to be the the best time to go ahead. There's a few comments in uh, in this. Uh, speaks to a question too that came in by email with concern about wildlife interactions because of the garbage roadside garbage service. So um, what consideration I guess has been given into the potential for wildlife interactions um, and how is that kind of addressed in the plan? Yeah, actually, you know what, I'm gonna defer this over to Sarah. She's been in contact with um, WildSafe BC uh, specifically to this issue. Uh, she'll be able to speak to this a bit further. Yeah, thanks, Vivian. Certainly, uh, we are aware, you know, of the the bears and uh, and other ve vectors like rats and that sort of thing that that might have an interest in garbage. Um, so we we did ask, you know, the current subscription haulers, you know, if that's a challenge with the waste that gets put out, if they find that it has been attracting animals. Uh, they said, you know, in in our area, it hasn't hasn't been a problem. Um, you know, we have, as Vivian said, also spoken with Wild Safe BC, and they're an organization that looks to uh, reduce the um, the sort of attraction of bears to garbage, um, as well as other animals. Um, and they've been working with the village of Cumberland over the last few years. And it's a it's a multi pronged approach. You know, also looking at other attractants with, within a property, whether that's fruit trees or composts or um, dog food and that sort of thing. Um, so we've, uh, we've allocated some funds to potentially work with an organization like them through the launch of this program. But, you know, ultimately, this isn't, this isn't garbage that didn't exist before. Uh, this is waste that people are managing now. Um, you know, certainly there's a benefit in rural properties and that they do have a bit more space often than uh, some urban properties, uh, outbuildings, that sort of thing to keep, keep the garbage secure. Uh, so while we recognize it is a change for some people, the proposal to go from one week to two weeks, we also hear from people that say they don't go to the landfill more often than, you know, every other month or, or four times a year. Um, so certainly, um, you know, as we move forward, if we see that there are areas that have wildlife challenges, you know, that that's something that we can, we can make changes and adjustments for. Um, but um, yeah, we, we are optimistic that, um, you know, with education and, and, and good practices, that this won't uh, create additional uh, issues with wildlife. Great, thank you guys. 
I just want to reiterate that the where there are comments in the chat, we are collecting those. Those will form part of our summary of feedback. So we 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 do see them, and we appreciate you giving that feedback. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm posing the questions to the team uh, while we have that time with them. So um, moving forward, just I guess a question about. Um, Kind of what is the main motivation here? Is it is it really about um, being able to reduce the cost for the service to residents? Um, and if not that, what is it? Um, as uh, Jake had already, or sorry, James had mentioned, it, the motivation is to increase diversion. There is by by providing. Um, sorry, let me just go back. When we did the uh, consultation back in twenty twenty. Um, a, a large segment of the right of the respondents, uh, roughly about two uh, two thirds of the residents, are currently subscribed to a private collection service. Of that, two thousand residents or respondents, only one hundred forty seven. I correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Um, were subscribed to recycling service. So that means the materials that are coming from these households are all going into the landfill. So these are materials that could that it's essentially is a resource and could be better utilized um, and managed in other ways. And we want to make sure that, as you can also appreciate, the cost to run a landfill uh, is expensive. And we want to ensure that it's only the materials that needs to go in there will be going in there. So we want to make sure that um, we were providing residents with the a convenient way to be able to dispose of their waste in a uh, environmentally responsible manner. That is our, there's no hidden motive. This is what we're trying to achieve. and. Um, and that's that's the premise of this whole um, proposed service. Great, thank you, Vivian. So I'm just I'm I want to acknowledge that we're down to our last few minutes to the one o'clock timeline. I know I connected with the project team and they are, they are able to stay on for another fifteen minutes. And since we still have a number of questions in the chat, I think that we will uh, take you up on that offer, guys. Um, but knowing that some people will have to drop off at one given their own schedules, I'm going to just screen share again the last slide I had that had the websites and the contact information. Then we will. Go, keep going for another 15 minutes or so with questions. If you have to leave, uh, thank you very much for joining us today and we appreciate you being here. You can drop off at any point. Um, otherwise, we'll keep working through a few more questions here. I'll just share that screen and then get back to our chat questions. So uh, the next one that I have is, um, how would this be billed and how frequently would it be billed? Uh, we are looking to um, build this on a quarterly basis, similar to what uh, residents are currently being built by their um, private companies right now. Okay. Um, so just scrolling down a bit more, um, there's a question about um, about the maybe sometimes people perception that recycled materials are actually ending up in the landfill anyway. Um, so maybe could you give a bit of perspective about the current recycling materials and how much is actually being properly recycled and what of that actually ends up in a landfill? Okay, yeah, this is it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, so this, as in the way of background, uh, since China had introduced the uh, National Sword Program, which severely restricts uh, contamination limits on recyclable materials, it's been very challenging uh, to, to get rid of this uh, recyclable waste, um, I'm sorry, recyclable materials. So this means that uh, China will not be accepting shipments that are mixed with trash and the different types of uh, recyclables, low quality recyclables like greasy uh, paper goods and things of that nature. So this policy was announced back in 2017 and it officially began uh, at the beginning of 2018. Um, in addition to the bans, uh, China has been a, reducing the number of import licenses, which means that fewer businesses are able to import goods um, as uh, China being the primary recipient of this material, their policies have dramatically impacted the flow of uh, recyclables in, in most of North America. Um, but unlike anywhere else in North America, uh, the recycling system here in BC is very different as the majority of the recyclables, so things that are put into the blue 
uh, recycling containers are managed uh, provincially through, sorry, managed through a provincially mandated extended producer responsibility program. So uh, commonly referred to as EPR. So what we're trying to propose here uh, is to have this roadside uh, collection of materials. So in the case of printed paper and um, packaging materials, um, a not-for-profit organization, again, uh, the Recycle BC um, organization that I've been talking about, it works on behalf of the people that produce or sell the printed paper. Uh, recyclables who are responsible for paying that to, to, for the paying the, for the cost of this recycling program. So they have a number of partners across um, the province, including both uh, private collectors and local governments that they've been effectively working with uh, to reduce that contamination rate. So be, for those two reasons, uh, Recycle BC has really high volumes of recyclables with super low contamination uh, rates protecting them in the rest of BC. So really freeing them from the feeling the, the effects of that band uh, that I talked about earlier. So in BC, we're super fortunate to be able to, because of the existing markets for recyclables um, and materials that are collected through this Recycle BC doesn't really leave the province. Um, yeah, so through this proposed uh, roadside collection service, the uh, CBR, or sorry, yes, the CBRD will be promoting uh, the collection of uh, high value recyclables and encouraging residents down this low path of uh, contamination, which means no glass, no film plastics and uh, foam packaging. Um, again, this is probably a bit more information than what you're looking for, but uh, it this solid waste uh, recycling matter, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated one. And with the global markets, um, it's, a, it's been a significant blow and you'll, you, I'm sure you're probably hearing about this in the media. Um, so it's, uh, we, but in BC here though, uh, we're largely insulated due to the, uh, the APR programs that we have in place and our recyclable materials are continuing to be recycled. Um, I see Blair, Sarah, you will probably be able to elaborate on this as well. Yeah, I mean, just the short and sweet of it is, you know, the recyclables don't come to our landfill unless, you know, they're, they're terribly contaminated. So if, if a, a recycling bin has had a, you know, a whole bunch of wet food mess put in there and all the papers, uh, you know, un un unsortable and, and unmarketable, you know, those kinds of materials, they, they will maybe bring to our landfill uh, because they can't market it. But, you know, a properly sorted and, and clean recyclable, uh, Emterra locally is our, our facility that receives most of those materials and, and they are able to find markets for them. So we know there's a lot of mixed messaging out there and, and stories, new stories, but uh, we do want people to have the confidence that if you put that effort in and you do the right thing, that those efforts pay off and those materials are recycled. And this, you know, this uh, individual responsibility rather than commingled bins, um, we, we know has uh, shown over time that has lower contamination rates than commingled bins. So again, just furthering the ability to market that material. Right. Um, and just because I know some people might be dropping off, I wanted to just make clear, we're gonna be posting a recording of this video to the website, as I mentioned in the introduction. And if there are questions that we can't get to in the next 10 minutes or so, we will also be following up and posting answers to those questions to the Connect CBRD page. So, um, so if we can't get to everything here, we, we are totally committed to answering all those questions and following through. Um, just because I know that there's obviously still uh, a few ahead of us. So uh, let's see what we can get to, but we will make sure that there are answers for everybody who has an outstanding question uh, in the coming days. Um, will uh, recycling bins be supplied? It has been contemplated, um, but I don't. We're not. I don't believe we're going to be going forward with it. There may be a bulk buy option, um, but uh, I see again. I see Sarah has her microphone off as well. Yeah, we just we haven't really had a, a large demand for it. Uh, the intention is not to provide recycling bins. A lot of people have their own already, so we want them to keep using those. Um, but if we do hear a large demand, then as Vivian says, a, a bulk buy, sort of a discounted option to. To encourage people to participate is being considered, but so far it's, it's pretty quiet on that front. Um, and a message to me directly about whether or not the cost will be charged per house or per family. Um, so if there's kind of one house, maybe with two plots, two lots that are kind of used in tandem, will they be charged for two lots? If there's two families in one house, will it be per family? Do we have that detail yet? Yeah, it's going to be per 
single family dwellings. So it's, uh, again, it's so that it's aligned with the, um, the use per household. So if you are a single family dwelling, which is um, the definition is essentially a somewhere that where you have access to um, by a front door uh, with uh, bathing uh, facilities, uh, cooking uh, facilities and, and a place to sleep, that's considered as a one single family dwelling. Uh, if you have a secondary suite, that would be considered as an, another, sec uh, another single family dwelling. Um, so it's, it's as exactly as it uh, as it sounds. Um, and then, will you be looking to measure the diversion rates for recycling and um, kind of looking to see whether or not there is a measurable increase in diversion um, if this is implemented? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, it will actually be tracked as part of. If, if, uh, sorry, let me backtrack. Um, if we are included as part of the Recycle BC program, it will actually be part of their provincially mandated uh, annual reporting. Um, but this will definitely be uh, part of our our internal reporting as well. Okay. And then, if this service goes ahead, would the fee could the cost be part of the tax deferment option that is available to homeowners on their property taxes? Um, I don't believe so. This is uh, separate from their taxes, uh, so this is entirely a user base. I'm sorry, it's a user fee similar to if for those that are um, that have a water bill, it's it's the exact same thing, um, and it's not added to your taxes. Um, it is. I, mean, I, I can, I can, Sorry. I can just yes. jump in there really quickly. The, um, the regional district does collect the utility bills, uh, and if those bills aren't paid at the end of the year, then the utilities can get transferred to the property tax, which is collected through the province. So it, it would not be something that we would be able to defer, but we would, we would forward those outstanding utility bills onto the province of BC for collection. Okay. <clears throat> Um, do we have an idea of what other rural areas pay right now for garbage collection? Uh, the exact, the question is specifically like Royston, what the rates are um, currently? Um, I believe the Royston service area is in the low 100 mark. Is that correct, Sarah? Yeah, it's about 115, but that includes the Recycle BC discount of a, about 37 or $38 per household. Um, so you would add those two numbers up um, to get there. There's some questions about the Nanaimo Regional uh, District and their collection system that apparently has different tiers of collection service. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, and the question is kind of whether or not that kind of approach was considered here. Uh, yes, actually it was. Um, I, I, come, I came from the regional district of Nanaimo and I was uh, responsible for the rollout of that new automated curbside collection program. So the tiered system that uh, you're referring to is uh, for different uh, garbage cart sizes. Uh, so there were, um, recognizing that there are people that had has lower um, waste generation, so they can opt for a smaller can uh, at 80 liters for $165 a, a year, or the regular 100 liter container, uh, one, one 100 liter container every two weeks for 175, and then uh, the bigger container at 250 liters for 100, sorry, $250 a year. Um, there, it's again, it's a mandatory service. Um, there is no opting out of it, uh, but there is it does reflect um, the different ability. Sorry, different sizes, so that uh, it um, can reflect the waste disposal needs uh, for residents. Yeah, and the, the main difference between that service and our service, for those who aren't familiar, is the cart. So the cart is a, a is a container, those wheeled containers with the lids. And those were all provided by the regional district of Nanaimo to every resident in that service. Um, and they've had an established service in their regional district for a while. And so this is an improvement on that service to be able to offer those carts. And those carts have RFID tags on them. So as they're lifted and they're connected to each house, um, they can make sure that, uh, that it's connected to the right house uh, so that everybody's transparent. That level of sophistication isn't, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we wanna you know, be able to introduce this service 
uh, first and, and you know, get people uh, comfortable with the idea of a, a roadside service. Um, so that, that's why we're not able at this time to kind of offer that tiered uh, program. And our middle ground that we're looking for is, is the bag tags. So that offers that additional uh, capacity for those who need it uh, without incurring additional costs for those who don't. Great. Um, another kind of practical delivery question, uh, just from a resident wondering if all of the recycling materials would be required to be actually in a bin. Um, there will be restrictions about how it's how it's placed at the roadside and what can be collected. Uh, it would need to be contained in some form, ideally in a container uh, with a lid, uh, especially given that uh, this is um, some most of this is going to be in rural areas. Uh, that lid will be able to um, protect the recyclables, especially the fibers, so the, your paper type products uh, from the elements. Um, so ideally that would be the case. Yeah, and I think important to mention too that it can't be bagged. So we mm -hmm. want it to be loose. So not in a clear blue bag or a clear plastic bag or a black bag. Um, so either in an open sort of typical recycling bin that you might already have, or as we've been said, if you're looking to get one, get one with a lid, um, but, but contained in, in something, but not a plastic bag because that causes problems for them. Great. Okay, so I'm just looking at the clock and we're we're kind of at the end of our even our extra time, which is great. I think with that extra time, though, we were able to get through uh, definitely the bulk of questions. I know there are some there are some that we will need to um, that we'll need to carry over to follow up for the website, but we're in uh, pretty good shape. So thank you, Vivian and Sarah and team for uh, taking all that time. Again, the comments in there will form part of our summary of feedback. So thank you for people who um, just added their thoughts and um, input back there. Um, I'm going to put up our final screen one more time just so that we can, um, you guys can quickly access the oops. Um, the email or the website addresses if you need them. Um, but other than that, again, we'll be posting the video of the session online in the next few days. Uh, you can see the website addresses here. We thank you very much for your time today, uh, for setting aside uh, this hour with us. Hopefully you had a lot of your questions answered. Um, and please feel free to follow up if there are any other outstanding ones that you would like to connect with the team about. So with that, Thank you, CVRD team. Thank you, uh, residents, for joining, and we appreciate everybody's time today.